Matt Carpenter is the best home run hitter since Barry Bonds. And yes, I'm dead serious. Let me take a minute to explain. This chart shows the top 50 most efficient home run hitting seasons in Major League history based on their number of at-bats per home run. The lower down the chart, the more efficient the season. The lowest point on here is 2001 Barry Bonds, who homered once every 6.5 at-bats during his record-setting season. The size of the bubble represents their number of plate appearances, and all of these are qualified seasons, meaning that everyone here got at least 3.1 plate appearances per scheduled game. There's some Negro Leaguers on here who played less recorded games, like Josh Gibson. The 60-game 2020 season has Luke Voigt as his lone representative. And hey, there's my old buddy Kevin Mitchell with the convoy of 1994 seasons. You'll notice the majority of data points are between 11 and 9 at-bats per home run. Babe Ruth, Josh Gibson, Mark McGuire, and Barry Bonds are the only guys with sub-9 seasons. If you have a season within this range, congratulations, you were the best hitter in baseball that year. So where exactly does Matt Carpenter fit in here? As of August 9th, Matt Carpenter is having the 8th most efficient home run hitting season ever, and the most efficient since Bonds in 04. Even with the juiced balls increasing home run production league-wide these last few years, these waters have gone completely uncharted since the steroid era. I won't hesitate to point out that he isn't close to qualified, but my counterpoint is that he hit just 3 homers in 130 games last year. He hit a homer once every 69 at-bats. I haven't checked the data, but I'll go out on a limb and guess that most guys on this chart never had a season that bad. At age 36, Carpenter tore down and rebuilt his swing from the ground up, and now, just months after seemingly being out of the league for good, he's a key member of the best team in baseball. Here's how he did it. In 2018, Matt Carpenter wrapped up his best offensive season yet at a phenomenal six-year stretch. He completed his evolution from a doubles machine with a high average in 2013 to more of a 3 true outcome slugger, finishing 2018 with a career-high 36 big flies. During that six-year window, Carpenter was a 131 OPS plus hitter, meaning that he hit about 31% better than league average, and he was worth about four wins above replacement each year. Before 2019, the Cardinals traded for Paul Goldschmidt to play first base, pushing Carpenter back to third. He had a down year, putting up career lows in most categories, but he was still the team's starting third baseman entering 2020. The Cardinals' 2020 season was interrupted because of a COVID outbreak, causing a 17-game delay between their fifth and sixth games, and Carpenter never really found his footing. On February 1st, 2021, the Cardinals traded for Nolan Arenado, and just like that, Carpenter was displaced from the lineup that he anchored for over half a decade. I already mentioned that he only hit 3 homers in 130 games in 2021, but that was a bit disingenuous. He only made 44 starts that year. He was nothing more than an overpaid pinch hitter, and he wasn't any good at hitting, putting up his third straight year of career lows across the board. Of course, the Cardinals declined his team option for 2022. Matt Carpenter was a 36-year-old free agent coming off three straight unproductive seasons, each one worse than the last. Most players in this scenario hang up their spikes. Maybe they get into broadcasting or open up a restaurant. After all, Carp earned nearly $90 million during his time with the Cardinals and went to three All-Star games. If that was all she wrote, his big league career would go down is a great success, but Matt Carpenter still had something more to prove to himself. He made a phone call to longtime division rival Joey Votto, who was coming off a resurgent 2021 campaign thanks to a more home run oriented approach. Votto told Carp that he didn't think he was done, but he would have to completely revamp his approach to training to find himself. He credits this phone call with Votto as the turning point, the moment that really got him fired up to make some changes. In the next few months, Matt Carpenter went on a journey. Matt Carpenter visited the Baseball Performance Lab in early December. The Marucci partnered lab in Baton Rouge uses biomechanical metrics to show hitters their strengths and weaknesses. The overall goal is to outfit hitters with an optimal bat for their size and swing path. Carpenter's main goal was to find the flaws in his swing. Here's how it works. Players measure their lower body strength with a vertical jump, core strength with a medicine ball toss from a sit-up, and upper body strength with a medicine ball chest pass. These results are used to calculate what a player's exit velocity should be when he barrels up a ball. The results from the lab indicated just what Carpenter suspected. He wasn't aging and getting weaker. 
but something was mechanically wrong. His base strengths measured out above MLB average, but when he took his swings, his exit velo was well below where it was supposed to be. Analysis of his swing showed that his bat wasn't staying in the strike zone long enough and he wasn't generating as much force with his swing as someone with his strength should. The lab also recommended he switch to a bat with slightly more weight in the barrel, suggesting that the bat that he used for over a decade of pro ball wasn't the best choice for him. Carpenter admits that he was skeptical of analytics before this, but the trip to this lab opened up his eyes to how much he had to fix. His next stop was SoCal, where he met up with hitting instructor Tim Laker. Laker was Goldschmidt's hitting coach during his last two seasons in Arizona, and Goldie recommended him to Carpenter and Arenado, who trained with him in early January. Carpenter's replacements and rivals were the guys who set him on this path. One thing I really realized while researching this story is that this league is truly a brotherhood. These guys want to help each other succeed as much as possible until the competition begins, and that's pretty cool. What Laker first noticed while looking at film and heat maps was that Carpenter was rolling over more and more pitchers on the inner half of the plate. His bat path was all wrong and his front knee was locking up. When he first got into the cage with Laker, Carpenter looked nothing like a successful major league hitter, but one drill at a time, Laker hoped to remaster Carpenter's swing. He did it by throwing frisbees, balancing drills in the cage, hip engagement drills, and many many more unorthodox methods. Just a few reps focusing on each tweak added up into a swing that looked much more like 2018 Matt Carpenter than 2021 Matt Carpenter. His two day session with Laker did a ton to put him on the right path to refine his swing, but 5 hours of training doesn't make a hitter. He wasn't done yet. Matt Holliday volunteers as a hitting assistant at Oklahoma State, where his brother is the head baseball coach. When he received a text from his former teammate Carpenter asking to get some work in at the OSU facility, he immediately extended the invitation. In the weeks leading up to his OSU session, Carpenter had focused on what he learned with Laker, but he felt as if he wasn't fully where he wanted to be. During their first day working together, Holliday diagnosed the remaining flaw to be Carpenter's lackluster hit movement. They did some basic T-drills and cage work in an effort to sync everything up that he had worked on. During their second day, Matt Carpenter was back. Holiday said the sound off his bat was just different. He was hitting the ball like a great big league hitter again, and all the data supported exactly how he was feeling. In a February interview with Ken Rosenthal, Carpenter said that he was more confident in his swing than ever before. Vado, Arenado, Laker, and Holiday all believed in him, and they all saw that he had something left in the tank. The next step was finding a job. Despite a handful of big league offers on the table, Carpenter signed a minor league deal with his hometown team, the Texas Rangers. He wanted to earn his way back into the bigs, but the spring training results weren't pretty. He was assigned to the AAA Round Rock Express, where he also began slowly. Through his first six games at AAA, he didn't hit for extra bases once, and he struck out in a third of his plate appearances. But on April 17th, against the Sugarland Space Cowboys, he put everything together. He kicked off a red-hot 15-game stretch with his first homer of the year. Exactly one month later, he played in his last AAA game also in Sugarland and homered in his third straight game. He was back. Carpenter spoke with Rangers GM Chris Young after the game, and Young agreed to release him when it was clear that he didn't have a spot in the Rangers lineup. He was back on the open market, but this time, he was looking for a job at the highest level. And it only took him one week before a team called. But it wasn't just any team. It was the best team in the majors. The Yankees were a scorching hot 31-13, but with multiple injuries leaving holes in their starting lineup, they signed Carpenter to a major league contract on May 26th and flew him out to St. Pete to start that night. Giancarlo Stanton and Josh Donaldson were each on the 10-day IL and would only be out for a brief window of time. Carpenter just needed to do enough to stay on the roster once the injured players returned, and he made the most of his first 10 games. With 6 homers, 13 RBIs, and an astonishing 1592 OPS, Matt Carpenter let it be known that he would not be giving up his roster spot anytime soon. When the starters were finally healthy, he was relegated to mostly pinch hitting duties, but in his first start in over a week on July 2nd, he hit his way back into the lineup with another multi-homer game. He had another 2 home run, 7 RBI game against Boston later that month. Let's take a quick look at what makes him such a great hitter. His strikeout rate is back down around 2018 levels, his ground ball rate is at a career low by far, and his power numbers are at sky highs. He's also pulling the ball more than ever, and he's playing in a stadium that caters to lefties who pull fly balls. His swing spends more time in the zone than ever before, and it enters the zone quicker, so he's able to get the barrel around to those inside pitches instead of burying them into the ground or swinging through them. This would have been so much harder before the era of biomechanics, and Carpenter finally took advantage of the advancements that have been made in that field. His success diagnosing his problems through cutting-edge analytics may open the door for other veterans to accept the new age of player development. 
I wish I could wrap this up with a happy ending, but on August 8th, Matt Carpenter suffered a fracture after fouling a ball off his foot. At the time of this video, a return this season is very much up in the air, but it's already been made clear how much the Yankees miss Carpenter's bat. In their next 7 games after the injury, the Yankees scored just 9 runs and won only once. Missing Stan for extended time and a few other starters with minor injuries have definitely contributed to their second half struggles, but the lineup has just felt so much thinner without its best lefty bat. If Carpenter is healthy come playoff time, he should find himself in the starting lineup. If he can't make it back by then, I hope he stays in the Bronx for a few more seasons. I love watching this guy play.